You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Burz Puya. In this week's program, we interview Gita Sahyal on what's wrong with Theresa May's review of Sharia courts in Britain. It stinks, that's what's wrong with it. We'll also be talking about the death penalty and the law of retribution in Iran. The youngest uh, boy to be killed on the British-French border, trying to get to Britain, and an insane fatwa on uh, best that men have the right to divorce uh, than to kill their wives. Very generous of them. Very, very generous. And our slice of life is of a Yazidi survivor of uh, atrocities of ISIS who's become a UN goodwill ambassador. Stay with us. The International Committee Against Executions has recently issued a list of around 230 people who are facing either execution or qisas punishments, which is the punishment of retribution in one prison in Iran, Rajai Shah prison. Only one prison. Yeah. I mean, that shows the extent of the atrocities committed by the Islamic regime in Iran, how many prisons there are in different cities in Iran. And these are people waiting to be executed. And also Qassas is the yeah. act of retribution where, for example, if you've blinded someone in a fight, then they will actually put acid in your eye and blind the eye that you've blinded. Barbaric. Barbarity it's of Islamic absolute vision. barbarity. And so the committee has published these names in order to make sure that they're not killed and uh, tortured in this way without their names uh, being known and also to help uh, ensure that there's, you know, a campaign in defense of people. No one should be executed. It is, you know, the state's act of murder against citizens. And of course, no one should be, uh, the, you know, the justice system is not meant to be about retribution, That's is right. it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, w what I recently saw on um, Facebook is the case, the mother, Shole Pakravan, of uh, Rehane Jabari. She was executed. Uh, uh, because in an attempt to fight off her rapist, the man was killed. And she's become, you know, a really well-known campaigner against executions and for rights in Iran. And she had this lovely uh, photo of her shoes. Old you know. shoe that she, she wore for eight, nine months while she was campaigning yeah. and fighting for, uh, for her daughter to be saved from execution. Um, you know, she tells the story how she... Um, she bought a pair of shoes, she was running around, going to a Ministry of Islamic Justice, um, going to the prison, Evin prison, uh, appealing to different people, campaigning in those pair of shoes. And actually she's got a pair of, a photograph of these old pair mm. of shoes as a memory of her fight. Even when she was burying her daughter, mm. she, was, she, she, she had it on and she took it off to go into her grave to bury a daughter and this is such a sad at the same time it's such a symbol of resistance, resistance in the yeah. Iranian society. and also you know when she talks about her daughter the way oh my gosh the love for her daughter and I think that's one thing that when you talk about names and even statistics of executions 230 people for example in one prison the amount of love that people have for them they are someone's beloved uh, facing this sort of brutality does make you wake up and realize just how h horrible this is. And of course, people are fleeing the situation all the time. We've heard news of a 14-year-old Afghan boy who had the right to be in Britain because he has family in this country who couldn't wait anymore in the terrors of the Calais jungle. 40, uh, 14, 14, 14 years, years old. old. Who's he responsible died. for this? Who is responsible for life of that young child who has a right to seek asylum, who has, as a human being has a right to move anywhere they want? I mean, and that's the thing. But I mean, and children cannot be illegal. Why is he right. kept in, in such horrific conditions that he ends up dying before he but enters he Britain? But he even had family in this country. He has a brother and uncles, who meant, which meant that he had automatic right to be here. And he 
uh, you know, when I was reading about what happened to him. It, it was in the Independent, an exclusive news report. He tried to get on a lorry. The lorry swerved to throw him off and he was run over by a car and neither the lorry nor the car stopped. They didn't stop because to them, he's just another asylum seeker. He's expendable. And it's just, just really, criminalization it of is criminal. human life. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. Recently, we interviewed Gita Sahgal, who is the director of the Center for Secular Space, to ask her about her opinion on Theresa May's independent inquiry into Sharia courts. Listen to what she has to say about Sharia courts and Theresa May's inquiry. Gita Sahgal, wonderful to have you on our program again. I wanted to speak to you about the whole question of Sharia law in Britain. You're one of the people who've been boycotting the government's so-called independent review. Can you explain why? What's wrong with that review and what you'd like to see instead? Well, Mariam, the, the tragedy for secular activists is that we have long wanted an investigation of Sharia in this country, and not just Sharia, but parallel legal systems. So on that particular issue, we're apparently on the same side as the fundamentalists who say, why are you only looking at Sharia? Why aren't you looking at other systems? So actually, we agree with them on that one. We don't agree on much, but on that one, yes. Because if you allow one bad system to exist, the other systems follow suit. They follow each other's bad practice. And that's why we were campaigning for an investigation, and we welcomed it when the government announced it. We were very excited. And then... One, we weren't that happy when they said it's only going to be in Sh on Sharia. However, we still said, okay, when it's, if, even if it's only on Sharia, we made our points. We said, we really want to have a wider review. We want to look at all parallel legal systems. And we want to look at injustice and access to justice generally. In other words, we, we need restoration of legal aid. Uh, and we need the Human Rights Act, which the government has abolished legal aid, uh, a lot of legal aid for family matters and has, is threatening to abolish the Human Rights Act. So Britain has gone from a gold standard of actual access to justice, which very few countries have, where people could get their rights, and women got their rights in violent marriages and so on, to worse and worse treatment. And that's the whole society. So Muslim women is a minority, and a minority where fundamentalists are ruling the roost uh, over them, or trying to, are having a much worse time than most other women, and all women are having a much worse time generally, who, who are trying to get a divorce now, uh, and so on. So even though we disagreed with the government's position, we still said, okay, a good Sharia review, which looked at the right things, would set a standard by which other parallel legal systems could be looked at. And there is a specific problem with Sharia, because the government has encouraged it. They've not necessarily encouraged other tribal courts or panchayats, which are, you know, like caste uh, tribunals and things like that, they haven't actively encouraged them. But there is evidence that the police and various bodies work with the Sharia councils. Um, the, there is evidence that the government has for years given money to fundamentalists as part of their countering terrorism program. Uh, and most people abroad are not they don't know this, it's really important to understand that, that the British government has poured millions into funding the promoters of Sharia in this country. They haven't popped up and established themselves out of nothing. Uh, and they've been going since the 1980s. Um, so you get a situation where women used to have divorces in the civil courts, and that was fine, and now they've been systematically told and our evidence that we have collected through the One Law for All campaign and the Center for Secular Space um, contributed to, to, to those, the testimonies that were collected. So we found through recent testimonies we've taken that people who had civil divorces were being harassed and bullied into going to the Sharia courts where they didn't want to at all for this fake, you know, a piece of paper which has absolutely no legal validity. It's, an, it's a British invention. When people talk to me about British Islam, I get very frightened because it's not some liberal thing. British Islam is what the government has created through the Jamaat-e-Islami, the Muslim Brotherhood, and even more far-right groups. 
as their partners. For a while, the Tories were fighting. There was, there was an argument within the Tory party about not allying with what they call non-violent extremists. In other words, the people who are extreme abroad but aren't planting bombs over here because they were a major plank of Tony Blair, New Labour's uh, alliances uh, when they were looking for Muslim allies in the war on terror. So New Labour allied with these people. Previously, multiculturalists had also, but it really came to a head with New Labour. Then some of the Tories went on. What's happened now, I think, is really serious, and we don't really realize it, that with Theresa May becoming prime minister and with people like Michael Gove, who's very much on the right wing of the party and has a lot of mad views on education and so on. But one good thing about him was he didn't like fundamentalists. And he strengthened investigations of fundamentalists when he was in charge at education. All that's gone now. Uh, and what's happening is that we've gone back to the old policies, you know, the politicians that tried to fight some of the far, the Muslim far right have gone and the civil servants that implemented these policies are in place. They've survived all these politicians. And we've gone back to this business of working with some fundamentalists in order to counter others. I mean, it's gone to the extent that in the war in Syria, their parts of Al-Qaeda have become Western allies. Right? So what we're talking about, when we're talking about Sharia and Britain, we're talking about actually huge international events which affect what the British government is doing here. And that's scary. That's really scary. So what we've managed to do with you, with the coalition from under the banner of One Law for All, uh, is to actually get a voice of women's rights advocates who have been fighting these issues, whether they're fighting Hindutva in India, like my mother, Nayantara Segal, who's a writer in India, fighting against increasing Hindu fundamentalism there, whether they're fighting in Bangladesh against uh, authoritarian, you know, the government authoritarianism and the jamaat e islami whether they're fighting in Iran or in, in, in Nigeria, in many, many, many places. They signed up with us, it, with our support. So this is, a, this is an example of the solidarity coming from the global south to us here in the north, because they know what these forces are. They are fighting them and have been fighting them for decades. They know exactly who they are so why, and what they why, represent. So why boycott the uh, review? Isn't it better to have a review than not have any at all? Well, we would love to have almost any kind of review, but this review Ha, it is so stitched up from the start. One, no human rights inquiry. I mean, you know, when there have been inquiries into atrocities in the war on terror against terrorist suspects and so on, the human rights organizations always write letters to the government saying, must be impartial, must be fair, it must be open, it must be people of a, you know, seniority able to you know, take on these issues and so on. Um, and they haven't done that. They do have a judge sitting on the panel. The panel is led by a theologian. Now, she may be quite a liberal person in her own life, but unfortunately, the way she's handled the critiques that have come her way, and not just critiques, but questions about the foundation of the inquiry, uh, the fact that the government is looking at good practice in Sharia. So it's actually it's answered its own question before it started. It's, it's not an open-ended inquiry. So it, it's, it's, or rather, weirdly, it, it's open-ended as to whether they're going to find discrimination. They do say that there appears to be some discriminatory practices. There appear to be some discriminatory practices, but they're, they're not open-ended about the result. You have to find good practices. So it's already in the language of the way the review was constituted. It's very narrow. It's looking for good practice. Um, it's looking mostly at women's rights, and yes, women are the worst sufferers, so that is, it's correct. They should look at women's rights, but if they don't look at issues like apostasy, blasphemy, wider issues of Sharia, if they've already said, as Theresa May did, that Sharia is very useful in people's lives, then and Sharia law, so she has acknowledged there is an entity that is Sharia law. And actually, even Muslims who believe in reforming Islam and so on, are contesting what is Sharia law. There's some of us who don't want any religious law anywhere near any of our lives. But even people who might say we live by our religious laws, 
because we believe in praying at a certain time or we believe in fasting or we believe in giving charity and those kinds of things. You know, I'm reminded of um, the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, Alia Hogben. She said, Sharia is not the sixth pillar of Islam. So the idea of Sharia law is contested among Muslims, let alone ex-Muslims or atheists who don't want to live with religious laws. The government has decided Sharia law is good for you, except in a few instances. So that was one area of extreme problems that we had. The other was that they first are led by a theologian, then they have two imams as advisors. They have no women's rights advocates or senior human rights advocates who understand gender issues, uh, domestic violence, gender-based violence, and certainly not apostasy blasphemy, anywhere near it. And we discovered that the judge sitting on it, there is a senior judge on the panel, not as a chair, and he turns out to be a Christian fundamentalist. So he, has be, he belongs to an organization that has been pushing against the direction of travel that this country has been taking and that human rights generally has been taking. In other words, it's an organization that opposed equal marriage, you know, same-sex marriage, it, it's, it, it's opposed rights for gays, it, it, you know, LGBT people, it, it, you know, they, they are, they seem to be on the same page as various right-wing groups in America that are, you know, really promoting a, a violently homophobic uh, atmosphere in Africa. You know, do we really want this kind of judge on the panel? I mean, you know, this is amazing. So we very reluctantly, our first in instinct was not to boycott, it was to ask for change. It was to ask for the terms of reference to be changed and broadened and for the imams to be, redu uh, to be uh, t taken off the panel and for rights advocates to be put on, uh, on as advisors, which could look at issues of law because one of the really deeply uncomfortable and but very colonial things that's going on with this is that this is a cozy theological discussion between the Christian right and the Muslim right. I mean, they may not all be right wing, but by saying that we believe in the Sharia concept and they're having a theological discussion, what they're not doing is looking at the way in which Sharia law as it's practiced in this country is actually going backwards. It's more aggressive than Pakistani law. It's citing Indian law, which is more aggressive than Pakistani law for Muslims. Because that's what happens when you have parallel legal systems. When you have a parallel legal system, you have the rights of minorities being worse than the rights of the majority. Because the majority feels that they can reform themselves. And you, you have feminists, you have women who can push for that reform. And so those laws get reformed a bit. They're not enough, but they, they do get reformed. But the minority gets left behind. So when the government has shown its hand so clearly in the way they set up the review, it's not a full-fledged public inquiry. That's the other thing. It's a review process which legally allows them to be completely untransparent about how they operate. They can do that. Now, even though they're entitled to do it, you may say, are they wise to do it? So on the one hand, you know, yes, they do need to be, would need to be careful about um, people giving evidence, and they have said that they'll take evidence in private. But who wants to give evidence in private? The women we work with don't want to give evidence to that because they don't know who's going to get it and how it's going to be used or discussed. So it's, it's a really frightening situation. But so we are boycotting the Sharia review because we cannot be seen to be party to something that has already made up its mind to legitimize Sharia law. What's wrong with Sharia law as a final question? I mean, why cannot people who are Muslim minorities, for example, in Britain, why can they not go to Sharia courts if they choose to go to it? What is the crux of the problem with these parallel legal systems? Well, if only they chose. I mean, I think actually there is a class of women that are so-called choosing. Why are they choosing? Because they want to be in a polygamous marriage. So they're basically doing what people have done through time immemorial. They're having a relationship with somebody who is already married. Now, I don't have a moral objection to that. But what they're doing is that their particular necessity, because they don't want to be seen as bad women, and in fact, a lot of their families would disapprove of them for doing what they're doing. So they're entering into these 
these anomalous so-called marriages uh, doing a nikah ceremony, which they feel justifies their position, that in, uh, they become halal instead of being haram, you know. And, but in, doing, in making that individual choice, what they're doing is introducing a system that justifies polygamy, that justifies systematic discrimination against women. So it rises beyond the individual choice of the, the human being. Because these days we understand that you don't make an individual choice to be a slave. You can't say, I choose slavery. There are some things that are abhorrent to us who believe in universal human rights. And there's a point at which you do not sit back and allow people to justify their individual choices in a way that will affect the choices of future generations. And that is what the women who are choosing it are doing. On the other hand, we, sh we show very clearly from the testimonies on the One Law for All website, numerous testimonies, that women who had got their rights in the civil courts were forced into the Sharia courts. There were other women who were abused by never having had their rights in the first place, who then are forced to use the Sharia courts as a recourse. Now, there are other civil remedies. They're a little bit complicated to talk about. It's beyond this remit. At some point, we should talk about it because organizations like South Hall Black Sisters and so on who don't work with Sharia courts are going, uh, you know, are looking for those uh, remedies for, for women. But access to legal aid is a very important one. Okay, thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Gita Sahkal. I think she raises some important points, some really important points about Sharia courts here in Britain. Uh, I think one of, one of those points is the links with the Islamist movement, how this is part and parcel of an Islamist project. And also, more importantly, British government complicity in encouraging this movement and the phenomenon of Sharia courts. Absolutely. I think this interview, in this interview, Gita Sarkel exposes the British establishment, uh, the Tory government and Labour government in actually supporting the growth of Islamic and Islam movement and Islamic Sharia courts in Britain. And let's be clear, none of the main political parties are opposing the existence of Sharia courts. And that's the problem. It has The pressure has to come from outside of the establishment. And that's why you'll see the reviews they'll do. It's very, very linked to maintaining these organizations. Yeah, this is about defending equality of all citizens in this country. We've just heard of uh, Muslim women's groups fighting for an end to Sharia rules in India because they say it's discriminatory. In India, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, it's discriminatory, full stop. Women, irrespective of their backgrounds and beliefs, have the right to equality, full stop. The insane fatwa this week is from the All India Muslim Personal Law Board, which has uh, gone to the Supreme Court. Uh, cheeky. cheeky. Cheeky, very cheeky. Um, looking into whether the Sharia law of men being allowed to divorce their wives by saying talaq three times should be banned, as some women's groups are asking. And they've said, well, it shouldn't, it should be kept because one, women are too emotional and that's why men need to have this right. But also they said, isn't it better that men can do this unilaterally instead of criminally murdering their wives or setting them on fire while they're alive? I mean, this is just amazing, isn't it? They're just so. What sort of example is that? This is generous of the Islamists. He said, right, okay, you have the option of murdering, killing, and mayhem, or we give talaq. There's no human rights here. There's no such thing. It's just, I'm, I'm just shocked the level of sort of argument. Did they not throw them out of the court? Uh, they should have thrown them out of the court big time. And I think something that the Muslim Personal Board needs to hear uh, you know, there is a, there are other options other than strangling your wife and setting yeah. her alight. And they must have said it with such glee in their faces uh, versus unilaterally divorcing her without giving her anything. What about human rights? There's, Equal yeah, rights? You know, there's something called that. You should try it. You won't. Try it. Other people have tried it. You, you won't be able to, but just try. Try.
The slice of life this week is of Nadia Morad. She is a young Yazidi Kurdish woman, survivor of the assault of Islamic State on women like herself, and she herself is one of the survivors. She has now been elected as the UN Goodwill Ambassador Against Human Trafficking. What a lovely story this Beautiful. is. Beautiful, and I fo actually I followed her. It's empowering. Yeah, absolutely. I followed her when she sort of uh, survived and she came in on a, a Twitter account and actually she, she's traveled different parts of the world telling the stories of her, her own stories and the plight of Yazidi women and people actually who survived this ISIS and the situation under that. And she's fought for human rights for women in Iraq, in Syria, in Kurdistan. Well, we salute her. Well done. And Nadia. we will now be ending our program. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. We look forward to seeing you again at the same time and same place. Have a good week. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. 
Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.